Okay, so welcome everyone. And please welcome to Bidei Gary and the Debian Electronics Bob. Thanks so much. Um, hello, everybody. This is BDL, BDL Garby. Um, this is sort of a continuation of a tradition that we started several DevConfs ago of having an electronics buff where uh, those of us who are involved in working on the packages for electronics design and related tasks in Debian uh, could report a little bit on what interesting things were happening with those packages, what some of the challenges were, what some of the plans would be. Um, I unfortunately must admit that, that until I woke up this morning, I had completely not thought about the fact that this being an entirely virtual event meant that the normal processes by which uh, people would arrive at a buff and sort of self-organize and uh, there's no huge distinction between who the participants are and who the attendees are would of necessity be different this time. And so I sent some messages out this morning poking some people that I thought might have interesting things to add to this session. Uh, I would like to encourage anyone who's uh, checked in and is listening to the stream today who would like to uh, contribute information about uh, what they're doing, uh, either with packages in the Debian electronics team or as a user of uh, packages related to electronics design in Debian, uh, to feel free to poke me on IRC or via email, and I will be happy to give you the appropriate link so that you can join us as a participant, an active participant uh, in this session. Um, if we don't get too many other folks uh, joining in, this could turn out to be a relatively short buff, which I guess is okay too. Everything about this is just a little different than it's been in the past. So what's the point of Debian Electronics? Um, there is a team in the Salsa uh, repository uh, mechanism called Electronics-Team. And if you have a look there, you'll see that there are some dozens of packages that um, are maintained for Debian by some subset of members of the team. Uh, these are uh, tools that are used for things like uh, schematic capture, printed circuit board design, simulation, um, uh, hardware description language design for uh, field programmable gate arrays and other programmable logic uh, devices. And very importantly, uh, since almost everything electronics these days includes some kind of an embedded processing element, a microcontroller or, or something, um, there are also software packages that are important to people developing electronics that are maintained by various members of the Debian electronics team. This includes uh, some compilers that are specific for developing code for use in embedded microcontrollers. It includes debugging tools, things like OpenOCD and some related uh, packages, which uh, can help with uh, debugging uh, software that's running on embedded processors. Um, <clears throat> and uh, of course, there are libraries um, that are uh, there to provide uh, the runtime environment for uh, things that are being programmed to run in these bits of electronics. Uh, the other speaker that um, uh, agreed to uh, actively participate is my business partner, good friend, and also a former member of the Debian Technical Committee, Keith Packard. Uh, he unfortunately is uh, tied up finishing up a work-related teleconference, but hopefully he'll join us shortly. Uh, and when he gets here, he'll talk to us some about the Pico LibC work he's been doing to give us all a better, um, more efficient uh, C runtime library for use in small embedded systems. Uh, the things that I personally wanted to provide some report or update on today are uh, in sort of two categories. Um, one is that we are currently working our way through a transition from a um, from the Gita GAF <coughs> um, package of schematic capture and related tools uh, to uh, use of the one of the forks of Gita GAF called Lepton EDA. Um, unfortunately, the situation is that a few years ago, uh, one of the upstream maintainers of Gita GAF uh, embarked upon a, um, uh, an effort to try and integrate uh, Python as an extension language into that tool set. Uh, as an addition to the use of Scheme through uh, Guile, which had been the initial extension language within the GNU GPL EDA toolset. Um, 
you know, sort of thinking about it in the abstract, um, Python as an extension language would probably have been a really great choice for a tool set like this. Unfortunately, the way that uh, integration and transition uh, was handled uh, had two negative consequences. Uh, one is that um, as far as I can tell, it was sort of never really completed. Um, it is possible in the Gita tool set to do some Python extension work today, but let's see, hang on one sec. Um, um, <clears throat> one of the um, uh, consequences was that that work was never really completed. And so while it's possible to do some Python extension things now, um, it's never really taken over as a, a primary way of doing such things within that tool chain. And there was never really any plan to sort of eliminate um, the scheme via Guile interface. So in some sense, that work just made the task of maintaining the Gita toolset get more difficult. And unfortunately, while I wasn't deeply involved in this process at the time, it appears in hindsight that one of the consequences is that a number of the people who were involved in the, hello Keith, a number of the folks that were involved in uh, the early maintenance work on that tool set who are very interested in um, uh, Guile and, and, and sort of scheme as an extension language were very put off by the way that integration happened. And so uh, they created a fork called Lepton EDA. And for a while, it seemed that the two forks were sort of proceeding along in parallel, and you kind of had your choice of which one to pick, and the source file formats were all compatible and so forth. Um, unfortunately, over time, it appears that the GEDA or GITA <coughs> upstream has become relatively inactive, while the Lepton EDA community has become quite active. And in fact, uh, not only have they not embraced the integration of Python as an extension language, they've actually been working very hard to refactor uh, some of the user interface code in uh, the schematic capture and attribute management and related uh, tools that are part of that suite uh, to sort of double down on the investment in Scheme as programming language and Guile as the way they implement that. Now, you know, we can all sort of scratch our heads about whether that's what we would really have chosen in the abstract, but the practical consequence is that a number of really ugly bugs in the GEDA toolset, including things like panics in the middle of making sig substantial cut and pastes or um, bus moves or other you know things in the schematic capture tool with um, uh, the GSCIM tool um, are just gone in <coughs> the Lepton EDA a equivalents like the lepton schematic. And since there's 100% file format compatibility, you can you can move designs and schematic symbols and so forth back and forth. There just doesn't seem to me to be any particular reason for us to work really hard to try and maintain both tool sets and Debian. It gets even more frustrating because uh, those who maintain the Guile language packages in Debian would really like to stop supporting Guile 2.0. Um, and, you know, for some time, the Lepton EDA tool set's been supporting Guile 2.2, and uh, in the upcoming next release, they will be explicitly supporting Guile 3.0. Uh, meanwhile, the GitHub stuff is really hard stuck on Guile 2.0, and since the principal remaining active upstream developer is all enthusiastic about the Python stuff and kind of doesn't care very much about the Guile stuff, I just don't see how that's going to change anytime soon. So. In order to kind of break the logjam and help the Guile folks out uh, in their process of getting 2.0 out of the archive before the next stable release, um, I have requested that Gita Gap, which is the source parent package for GSCAM and G attribute and the related uh, GEDA tools, I've requested that that be removed. There are a couple of tools that um, still have dependencies on that tool set because they want to use the netlisting tool to extract schematic information to use for other processes. I believe that those should be relatively trivial to update to use the Lepton EDA equivalents instead, but I didn't actually sort of volunteer to do that work myself. And uh, the guy that said he would do some work on it hasn't apparently gotten around to it yet. So uh, GDGAF is still in the archive, but um, as far as I'm concerned, it's on the way out. And anyone who's been using GEDA I should just install Lepton EDA and get used to using it because 
Um, it's sort of exactly the same, but slightly different. Um, they have been making some improvements and making some additions uh, to the things that are available in the user interfaces. And I certainly expect that will continue over time. Um, but so far, I personally have seen zero difficulty taking existing GEDA designs and just using Lepton Schematic uh, to do maintenance work on them. So uh, anyway, that's the first of the two things that I wanted to talk about. And obviously, if anybody has any questions, um, feel free to queue those up, and we'll try to figure out how to see those and how to answer them here uh, sometime soon. The second thing I wanted to mention um, is that I personally have been doing printed circuit board design with a different tool over the last year, year and a half, two years than I was at the last time that we had one of these buffs, or at least I think that change has happened since then. Um, and that is I used to use the, the sort of GEDA related PCB package. And um, it is actually still somewhat maintained upstream, though it's been a while since it had uh, a new release. Um, however, there's a fork of that that started several years ago um, and is currently being maintained by a small but very active group called PCB-RND. Um, and that's the program that I've switched over to using. Um, it has evolved substantially from PCB. Um, the user interface went through a significant uh, menu structuring redesign, which caused immense pain as I had to unlearn. <laughs> yeah, Keith, I know, sorry. As we had to unlearn sort of the old keystroke patterns and uh, learn the new ones to do the same things. Um, but there's a whole bunch of additional capabilities in PCB R&D that caused me to continue to feel like that was a reasonable choice. Um, this whole set of tools that I've been talking about are, to many people, just sort of an alternative to KeyCAD. And so if there's somebody around that wants to <clears throat> join us and, and give an update on how things are going with KeyCAD, that would be great. Um, but since I don't currently personally use that, except when I'm doing minor updates to other people's designs that started there, uh, the Lepton EDA and PCB-R&D tools are the ones that I personally am using for all my electronic circuit board design and, and layout needs. And I just wanted to make sure everybody understood that. In part, because as I've already mentioned, I've requested that GitHub be removed from the archive since I'm not maintaining it anymore and I don't know how we keep it working in Debian with upstream not being interested in getting Pascal 2.0. Uh, and because my personal attention is now much more on the PCB R&D package, um, I, there's gonna be much less active attention paid to the PCB package. If there's anybody still using PCB that wants to take over primary maintenance of that package, feel free to let me know and I'll be happy to support you in coming up to speed and dealing with that. So that's pretty much all the stuff that I wanted to talk about today. I see Keith is here. <coughs> Keith, you were gonna uh, tell us all a little bit about what's been happening with Pico PicoLibC. Sure. Is my microphone operational? I would assume so. I hear you just fine. Yeah, I'm gonna try to share some slides if I can remember how to do that. I think it's this window over here. There's a share desktop button somewhere. Yeah, I'll sh I will share my presentation instead. Okay, hey, that worked. Yeah, it kind of works. Um, We've been doing uh, we've been doing social meetings on Jitsi here in Portland for the last couple of months, so I'm I'm getting used to it. Um, seems to work pretty well. Okay, so um, I joined uh, Sci Five last year, and one of the things they wanted me to do was to keep fixing uh, embed the embedded libc uh, adventure because we have an embedded libc kind of a dearth of credible embedded libcs. Your audio went away, Keith. Is that working again? Yes, it's working again. OK. Um, uh, most of what people use in 32 and 64-bit embedded systems is Newlib these days. Um, but what I discovered is that Newlib is uh, developed and maintained almost entirely for the SIGWIN community who use it uh, on Windows. Um, and so the fact that there are a bunch of people trying to use new lib on embedded systems is a um, happy accident. Is that working again? Yes, apparently. Yeah, you're back. I don't understand what's going on. In any case, um, so I forked uh, Newlib and created 
Um, and that's been going on for a little more than a year. Um, I wanted to give a short update in what I've been doing here. Uh, so PicoLibc is a C library explicitly designed for embedded systems. Uh, it doesn't have any operating system assumptions. Uh, it's based on new lib and AVR libc code. Um, it's all BSD licensed, not my favorite license, but it's very popular in the embedded space. Um, and I kind of cleaned out all of the non-BSD licensed code in new lib so that it's really clear what the providence of all the code in PicoLibc is and what the licensing situation is. And that's made a bunch of people pretty happy. Um, I replaced the build system. Um, I don't know how many of you have played with the Maison build system. Uh, but it's it's pretty useful in this environment uh, because um, one of the things that Auto Tools spends a lot of time is is running shell scripts and Mason doesn't do that at all. Uh, so I'm building currently uh, 240 different variants of the library uh, in the CI system, which compiles um, which compiles some 13 million source code files, um, and that builds in about 40 minutes. I would hate to see what uh, what uh, auto tools would do to that. Um, other big changes is that it uses the native thread local storage support available in GCC. Um, and as a result, uh, one of the changes that's happened in the last year to the ARM, the, the uh, bare metal ARM compiler in Debian is that we've enabled the TLS support there. Um, if you're not using it, it should have no effect, uh, but it does mean that you can use it now. Um, and that gives you on, on processors with actual native uh, register support for TLS, it gives you register level. Uh, TLS support now, which is pretty cool. On Risk Five, Risk Five, the ABI actually has a thread local storage pointer, um, and so thread local variables on Risk Five are are actually more efficient than global variables now uh, because the thread local storage accesses reference to a a, a register instead of uh, having to construct addresses from constants. Um, and and the other thing that I did to Pico Libc, which I know is a shocking addition, is I added a bunch of testing infrastructure. Uh, Newlib had a bunch of testing code, uh, but it didn't work, um, and it was horribly broken, and it clearly hadn't been run in at least 10 years, probably more than that. Uh, so I fixed all the testing code that was in Newlib, um, and now it runs in the CI system. And you can go to the you can go to the GitHub uh, mirror of uh, PicoLibc's source code repository and see that it's running um, all those variants and and coming up with with good results. Uh, to keep the system working. Let's see. Uh, so recently, what I've been focused on in PicoLibc is a bunch of uh, math library bug fixing. Um, the testing uncovered a bunch of errors. So the tests actually run against PicoLibc uh, on RISC-V and ARM32 and ARM64. Um, and it also runs, uh, you can compile the library for testing purposes on the native architecture. And so I run the math testing on both PicoLibc and GLibc. And the goal is to make PicoLibc match GLibc. Uh, I just discovered today a place where that's going to be hard. Um, but I did identified a whole pile of minor errors. Um, one of the things I discovered was that the uh, fancy new math code that ARM added a couple years to go to new lib assumes that the fused multiply add doesn't drop precision in the middle of the operation. Um, and it misguessed which machines had that had that magic operation. And so a bunch of the math functions were just getting wrong answers. Um, another thing I did this year was I found some recent research in, in printf and scanf support for floating point numbers. Um, and so now PicoLibc has an exact printf and scanf implementation that doesn't do any memory allocation, which I think is unique in the libc space. Uh, glibc, uh, newlib, uh, they all have ar uh, arbitrary precision math packages that do a bunch of allocation to do this operation. Um, and uh, in an embedded environment, malloc is pretty hard to support. Um, and so it's nice to have exact floating point math, uh, uh, floating point input and output without that. On another thing that I've spent a bunch of time doing is improving uh, kind of the low level embedded support, uh, especially on ARM processors uh, and on RISC-V processors. Uh, so you can go look to PicoLibc if you want to learn how to do embedded metal, embedded bare metal application development on an ARM or a RISC-V processor. Uh, PicoLibc actually contains all the source code necessary to get the uh, processor out of uh, out of its startup phase and get the coprocessors enabled and get interrupts vectored. 
Uh, so you can figure out how to build an application without having to learn a huge amount of information about your processor uh, right up front. And so from a uh, or new developer perspective, I think PicoLibc should help people learn how to do this. It kind of gets you to the uh, AVR uh, state, where if you download AVR GCC and AVR libc, you can just compile and run applications really easily on uh, the 8-bit AVR processors. Uh, but on ARM processors and RISC-V processors, there's a huge amount you have to learn before you can get anything to run at all. Um, and so PicoLibc is trying to kind of fill some of the gaps there by, by showing you what the low-level support needs to be like. Um, we're actually using this stuff in Altos on, for our rocketry flight stuff now. So it's kind of got a real, a real world use case to know that it actually does work. Um, so that's, that's been kind of fun. Uh, ongoing work, I'm actually working on improving the, the uh, lightweight Malik implementation. Uh, to uh, make it um, use the heap a little more efficiently, uh, have fewer error, fewer weird error conditions, um, and simplify the the implementation. Uh, so that that work I'm planning on actually getting reviewed by the new lib developers because they've been helping me review review a bunch of the code. If I'm willing to port it back to new lib, uh, another thing that I did is I actually got the the uh, li library compiling with Clang. Um, not because I'm a, a fan of uh, non-free licenses like Clang doesn't quite want to use um, or non-share-like licenses anyhow, uh, but Clang has a lot of additional uh, error validation and testing uh, stuff and it checks different aspects of your programs. Uh, so using Clang uncovered uh, half a dozen bugs in the library, one of them pretty serious. It was actually a bug that Clang caught the first time I ran it, it said, this line of code looks very suspicious to me. I bet that's wrong. Um, and that bug had been there since at least 2000. So that's a 20 year old bug that I found just by running a different compiler. So um, if you have a project that has really old code uh, or even new code, I can strongly recommend running multiple compilers over it, seeing what they say. Also found um, a number of errors, again, in the math library where it was uh, not really errors, but kind of inefficiencies where the math library was uh, casting between floats and doubles with the implicit coercions that C so helpfully uses. Um, and so on a uh, processor with uh, hardware floating point and no hardware double precisions, uh, you'd, you'd call these functions and all of a sudden you'd link in a ton of double precision software floating point code uh, that you didn't want to because of the implicit coercions going on. So that was fun. Thank you, Clang. Uh, status. Uh, it's currently in unstable. Um, it was difficult to get in unstable because uh, just because uh, going through the new queue is complicated with a package with 85 licenses. Um, that was an adventure. Um, oh I've uploaded. Yeah. Oh my. <laughs> it it has a Debian compli uh, a uh, machine readable copyright file now, uh, whereas the new libcode did not, and I think that frightened some people. Um, there are currently ARM32, RISC-V, and LX106 packages in the archive. Um, I haven't uploaded um, ARCH64. Um, it's, I'm using the ARCH64 Linux GNU cross-compiler, which isn't exactly designed for embedded systems, but it works OK. Um, if anybody's interested in embedded 64-bit ARM development, I'd love to hear from you um, and figure out whether, whether it's, it would be useful for me to upload that. I'm using it as another 64-bit target for doing testing with, because uh, otherwise all I have is RISC-V, which is a useful target to test on, especially for me, uh, but it's nice to have more targets. Uh, let's see, one of the big problems that we have with, with uh, libc in the embedded space um, is that GCC uh, includes libstudded C++, and libstudded C++ has to be built against libc because it has IO functions. Uh, which means that right now in the archive, there are libstudded C++ versions for all of these targets, but they all use newlib, which as far as I know, nobody uses for embedded application development. The, 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 you know, usually the choice is newlib nano. Um, and that means that you can't do lib, uh, you can't do C++ development with embedded systems uh, using the Debian packages right now. So I would love to know if, um, if I need to provide um, libstudded C++ that's compatible with all the different libcs, which basically means building libstudded C++ against every libc and uploading separate packages. 
uh, which basically means building GCC a million times, uh, or if I can just abandon the uh, abandon the the older newlib and newlib nano stuff and and go fix GCC to work with Pico libc um, and sh just upload that. So that's kind of the the question that I have right now. Uh, I don't do C++ development on an embedded system, so I'm not probably the best one to answer the question on what we should do there. But if anybody knows of anybody who wants this functionality, I'd love to know what your what your thoughts are. And that's what I've got on Pico Libc. See, did we get questions in the Etherpad? Yeah, I don't know exactly how that's supposed to work. Um... Uh, I will. I will say the questions. Okay. Yeah. No, I'm, I'm reading. I'm reading the Etherpad right now, which looks like a great way ah, okay. to have questions here. Yeah. Well, Yes, I'm looking um, at I am I'm I'm the nice thing about Pico Libc is that it, it's really a pure cross compilation environment. Um, and so I really don't need to do I really don't need ARM sixty four boxes to do uh, native builds because nothing is ever built native. I'm using the cross compilers for everything. Um, I'm also the primary maintainer for the Risk V cross compiler in Debian. Um, and I, that right now is tracking uh, was is tracking what Sci Five is shipping for their SDKs um, because that helps me a lot. Um, we're moving that compiler from uh, GCC eight point three to GCC ten um, uh, in a in a week or so, and so that's going to be a transition for Risk Five. Okay. Um, let's see. Uh, I had a I question. Will stop you... sharing. Thanks. And thanks for the presentation, Keith. That's very cool. And of course, I'm thrilled because I get to benefit from that work directly in our joint rocket trailer related stuff. Andreas, I see that you're in here. Did you have something you'd like to contribute? No, um, really, I actually wanted to observe your, your buff as usual and um, I wanted to ask some question about this meta package issue which is definitely not the topic of the current talk because all this electronic details stuff it's it's way beyond what, what, what i'm doing yeah for those who might be watching the stream and don't know andreas is one of the folks that um is behind some of the meta package things that exist in debian and there is a debian science electronics package i guess it's called and uh, we have struggled in the past to sort of come up with the right way to manage the sort of contents of that meta package versus what the electronics team's working on and so on. It's really good to see you again. It's been a while. Um, <clears throat> I didn't get to DevConf last year, so it has been yeah. way too long. I missed you. Together. You are one of the big missings l last year. <laughs> What's wrong with yeah. you over there? Yeah, well, you know, now that I'm semi-retired and don't have a corporate travel budget, things are different than they used to be. So. <laughs> In any case, really good to see you, and um, that's a, that would be a great conversation. Uh, if you want to um, bring that up on one of the mailing lists, we could take it from there or reach out to me directly, and I'll be happy to try and pull some people in to, to help if, if that would help make things go forward. Now, let's see, we have somebody that wanted to talk about ASIC for you. I'm sorry, I'm not very good at figuring out who's who in the pad, we need to get you the link so that you can join in and talk to us. Um, I'm trying to figure out how to do that. If somebody else wants to beat me to it, feel free. Yes, I could share the link to the Jitsi room through the other pad. Great, thank you. But to fill the, the gap now, it's nice that we are made to this DevConf. Yes, because I, I have to admit that if this had been a real DevConf, there's a very significant chance that I would have not been there this year. So it's kind of cool um, trying out this virtual thing. It obviously is different. And uh, it makes it very clear that if we wanted to uh, have a really great boff in the future. We'll have to work a little bit harder at, at planning in advance, but that's the way things go. Ah, yeah. there you are. Hello.
Yeah, I agree. Corona told, uh, teached us something that we can meet way more frequently than, than just on DevConf. Yes, perhaps. Uh, Carl, would you like to, to jump in and talk about what you wanted to tell us about? It looks like he's muted. Oh, could you repeat again, please? So I see Carl joined us in the Jitsi room, but it appears that he's muted at the moment and his video just turned off. So, oh, there it's coming back. <laughs> it's coming Working back slowly. On. All right, radio check. Yep, gotcha. All right, do I have the floor? You do. Excellent, here we go. So this is not my project, but I hang out with the guy, Tim, AKA Mithro, whose it is. And I, I can sort of channel him. Sadly, he wasn't up to joining us right now. Otherwise, you get it straight from the horse's mouth. Um, well, we're very, we're very pleased to have you here. Thanks for joining in. Uh, Keith and I uh, were talking this morning about how it would have been great if we could have roped Tim into participating. <laughs> okay, so, so you know about this. That's good, because it's a little bit unbelievable. Um, T Tim does a lot of crazy stuff. Uh, he is very passionate about the same things we are. And uh, so this, this is a thing. Uh, I would say the short story is Google and a IC manufacturing lab in the United States have worked out a deal where uh, people like you and I, well, not me, because I am not qualified to engage this project. And, and, and the, sadly, most of us aren't, but maybe one or two of us are, or we know someone who is, which is submit an ASIC design and a few months later get back 200 chips for no monetary cost and i say monetary because we all know that you know web 2.0 all the things well the customer is the product etc cetera, etc cetera. And, and the catch here is your design has to be open you put it on github you let everybody see it google sees it Intel sees it, the Chinese see it, everybody sees it. And so, you know, if you have a problem with that, well, then uh, this is not for you. But if you've like, I've got this thing and it would be kind of cool if I had an ASIC and I don't really care if anybody else sees my thing, which, you know, that that's kind of, that's what a lot of us are about. Like if, you know, I, I love putting my source code out there to be critiqued and ridiculed and used and, and forked and patched and all the things. And so that's great. So, uh, so here we are. Um, there are five manufacturing runs scheduled. Uh, the first one is get your design in, I believe by November. I posted a link to the Fozzie Foundation's write up about this. You can get all the details there, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, so uh, there is room for 40 designs. Uh, the, the way this works is, oh, see, and now, I, now because this is not my gig, I fall short on the terms. The, the expensive part of ASIC manufacturing is having the little piece of metal carved out that the light shines through. And that piece of, Ah, yeah, people know what I'm talking about. Great, because um, I don't. Uh, so yeah, so there's room on that thing for 40 designs and then they will like imprint it across uh, a few pieces of silicon apparently a few hundred times that that all makes sense and then I don't actually know what they do with that thing they probably stick it on a shelf somewhere and who knows what's but anyway and then then these little pieces of silicon go through the little manufacturing process and a bunch get chucked out for defects etc cetera, etc cetera. and then they slice them up and they shove them in packages and they attach little wires to them and and shove them in a pack and then ship them out to you. And there you go. And then you, you've got a thing. Uh, and so there's, again, there's one at the end of this year and four more in 2021. Um, I, this has been announced at least a month ago. And I have no idea if anybody has successfully gotten one designed through the process of will your design work in their facility um, which is this is a, a big part of this project et cetera, et cetera, is manufacturing facilities have physical Processes. restrictions 
yeah, there we go. Those words. Um, <laughs> and yeah. one of the things Tim did was he cracked open one of these, these, what'd you say? Process? Processes, yeah. Yeah. Uh, so, from so, so I used to, I used to manage a team that maintained computing and resource uh, uh, networking resources for a big chunk of the, of, of old Hewlett Packard test and measurement. And, uh, at that time, we did a lot of um, IC and you know, ASIC and, and FPGA developments. If actually, FPGAs were brand new at the time, but ASICs were a big deal. And um, the the whole sort of the, the thing I've been concerned about with this, and you know, you're 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 bringing the point up quite succinctly, is that um, going from a good idea to an implemented design in any given process is a bit of a job, and the the you know there've been a lot of improvements made over the years in sort of how the processes get characterized, but um, it's still kind of a thing. So I would, I would caution. <laughs> yeah. It's, it's but, magic working so in this industry. <laughs> so this is, so this is I, you know, this is a really amazing opportunity. And if anybody who happens to be on today or, you know, watches the recording of this later, um, hears about this and has a good idea and has something you want to want to try, Absolutely, go for it. But so, did you tell? Did you tell us which it manufacturer it was? Sky River? No, Sky Water. No, which it, which lab? Isn't that I? I don't know. Then <laughs> uh, let I, me read the link I posted. <laughs> okay, I I have not heard. They're in Minnesota. If that helps. I don't know how many are there in Minnesota. Zero. It's it's oh. clearly forwarding to something. Yeah. I was kind of curious about that. Uh, dun, dun, dun. How many tabs? It's it's somewhere. Sky something or other. Let's see. It's not Chrome. It would be over here in Firefox. See, Chrome is for Jitsi and Firefox is for other things. Yeah. There we go. Those guys. I totally agree with Chrome for Jitsi and Firefox for other things. <laughs> totally agree. So, I've been, I've been so, having success with Chromium with Jitsi. Yeah. It works yeah, Chromium, better than Chromium, Firefox. Yeah. Chromium is fine. Even seen working a, a Jitsi with Chromium on an ARM 64 processor in this. In I'm, I'm, I'm thoroughly enjoying Brave, which is sort of a community rebuild of the Chrome stuff in without all of the phone home things in it. and for those who haven't stumbled into it, I'm enjoying it. I've not completely abandoned Firefox yet. There are a couple plugins that I sort of depend on that I haven't been able to find equivalents for, but that's life. Um, okay, well, thanks very much for the pointer to that. Um, if sure. you have anything else you want to add, that's great. Otherwise, thanks. One more, one more. Okay, uh, sure. it, this is to help encourage uh, participation because a lot of people have said, well, that's silly, et cetera, et cetera. And I would like to point out if you can take your ASIC to your resume when you handed it off to get an electronics job, I think it would float to the top of the pack. You can say, yeah. I made this. And so so I, I read through the, I read through the information that, that, that Skywater uh, produced. This is actually a fa a 20 year old fab uh, that apparently is in the U S um, and it's it's a 130 nanometer node, so it okay. I, so that yeah, wow, it, kind of I mean, bigger I'm, than what I'm used to, but <laughs> well, yeah, so it's an actual hand, it's actual there's, fab. There's there's cool stuff that could be done there. Um, yeah, 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 particularly for freedom loving folks who kind of care about where their bits and pieces come from and what happens to the IP. This could be quite interesting. I mean. Keep in mind, we had some pretty cool computers in 1999, whenever this technology was cutting edge. Um, so yes, you're not going to make the next iPhone, but it, it's a start. It was yeah, yeah, absolutely. This was Tim evangelizing various companies. I, I was in the room with him when he was talking to them, saying, "You know, look, if you if you make your information open, people will critique it and improve upon it, and you will win." Yeah. And I, I suspect he had that conversation twenty, More fifty, a hundred times before someone said, "Okay, we're willing to give this a shot." 
Yeah. Well, and 100 theater, there's there's no magic. I mean, 130 nanometer is is actually a very easy process uh, to design for because there isn't there aren't a lot of process dependent variables there. So you could put together uh, a lot of very credible uh, uh, things that would just work on it. Um, it, it runs it, it runs at 3.3 volts, which is pretty awesome. Uh, so you can actually do 3.3 and maybe even 5 volt I/O on that process, which would be really useful. Uh, one of the challenges we have these days with sub 40 nanometer processes is, I'm sorry, it's 1.8 volts or lower, uh, which really sucks when you're trying to connect it to other devices. Uh, <laughs> yep. So building a system around these chips would be much, much easier. Yeah, I'm. I'm be curious to know if they have if they have um, if they have flash modules that you can integrate. Uh, this sounds f familiar. I know that there's a Risk Five core like on the oh god I, I used to know this word like your chip gets a bunch of baggage along for free and you have the option of of interfacing the the cpu core with your thing in yep. case you want help debugging it is sort of the the <laughs> yeah. sticking a risk five sticking a risk five processor on this node would be would be easy yeah, there, there's lots of available risk five cores that could be compiled for this process. Um, by the way, K K uh, we, I talked to you at Pi Petaluma, Pi the, the Python conference out in California. Yes. Um, did I talk to you about FOMU? And can we? Are you all ready for to transition into another thing that I'll plug much quicker? Maybe. I, th I think we've all played with FOMU. Yeah, oh, okay. FOMU is awesome. Okay. Well, yeah, that that because because that's one that we can actually all engage in this this ASIC thing. Once again, it's like yeah, that that's out of my pay grade by you know years of I would need you know I would I would not waste people's time mucking around in that. But yeah, FOMU, good stuff. So all right. Okay. So I think I've got enough. Yeah. Thanks. Appreciate it. Um, and, you know, uh, anybody who's not already hanging out on the Etherpad, please feel free to drop links and things there that would be interesting for other folks that are that are hanging out today. Uh, is there anybody else? I was just trying to skim through. Is there anybody else that wanted to uh, join us and add uh, anything to this discussion today? Uh, if not, I think we're getting perilously close to wrapping up. Don't actually see anybody else in the channels. Anybody else see anybody anywhere that's foaming at the mouth to, to hop in? Okay, well, if not, um, I, I will reiterate the plea that I've made at all of the previous renditions of this BOF, and that is that um, what happens in this subteam in Debian is, uh, just like all the others, uh, entirely dependent on who's willing to show up and do some work and help keep things running and uh, packaging cool new stuff. Um, <clears throat> so uh, if uh, electronics design and embedded programming and uh, simulation, all of the things that uh, I talked about in the introduction are things that you're interested in um, and you'd be willing to uh, give us a hand by investing a little bit of uh, time and energy to help us keep all these cool tools working in Debian, please come find us. Um, there, as I mentioned, is an electronics-team uh, sub thing uh, within Salsa, which is where all the current uh, team maintained packages uh, tend to live. There are a few interesting electronics packages elsewhere, but that's a great place to go take a look. Uh, skimming through some of those and looking for which ones you know have interesting open bugs that could be tackled or anything like that. Um, if there are particular tools that you're using yourself that aren't in Debian, uh, feel free to reach out to us, and I'm sure one or more of us will help you figure out how to get those packaged in, into Debian so that we can all collaborate in maintaining them, using them, and making things better for the future. So with that, thanks, everybody, <coughs> particularly those of you who jumped in to, to uh, help with the uh, content today. Uh, thanks very much for your time and attention, and enjoy the rest of DevConf. Thanks a lot, Dale, and thanks to everybody who has attended this well.